Good morning. We're very excited to have you here today for the unveiling of the .NET platform. The .NET platform is going to make it much, much easier for you to build the most compelling web services and web applications. Those of us who have been working on this thing for the past three years can't wait to show you what we've been doing so we can get your feedback on it, make the final round of changes, and get those bits to you so you can ship product on it. Now, tomorrow morning, after LG, this is what you're going to get. We're going to have the bits. So that's what we're going to talk about. And you've already got some of these things sitting there. So we're pretty psyched about this. Okay. I'm going to take about 20 minutes and go through a quick roadmap so you can see how all this fits together. Then Mark Anders is going to come on during this session. He's going to start walking us through the code. We're going to see how the .NET framework and ASP, the next version of AS, ASP Plus, the next version of ASP, work together to let you build web service very easily to support our new data architecture and so on. Then Anders Heilsberg, who you probably know from the Turbo Pascal days, he's going to talk to us about the integrated .NET framework classes that he's built. Dave Menlin is going to walk us through Visual Studio and show how the tool targets all these things. Amit Middle is going to come up and talk, us, talk to us about how to stitch together a complex set of web services to handle a sophisticated business process. And then finally, Dave Reed will come and talk to us about keeping these web services running 24 by 7 under the most demanding circumstances to do automatic monitoring and to respond to the, the load of the system as it's underway. Okay, so with that, what I'd like to do is just kind of take a minute and, and look at this in perspective. So when the web was first introduced, browsers showed up and they were pretty simple. You take an HTML file out of the file system, you display it in the browser, and uh, it was kind of about viewing documents. It was pretty static. But the web had a couple of very compelling aspects. The first was that somebody was running a service. They were running the DNS service for you. So you in www.yourcompany.com, and that would map to an IP address. And that IP address could then be routed to an appropriate machine, and we could start using things like Cisco local directors and so on to get some pretty interesting scalability about that. So we had a global namespace, we had ubiquitous connectivity, and we had a ton of innovation going on in the internet infrastructure. Meanwhile, there was this separate thing happening, which was the client-server world. And there was a really great programming model. VB and other products like that were allowing developers to hook together and create very rich user interfaces to do the business logic, to take the component model and to talk to things like host servers and data, and to produce pretty sophisticated applications. And those were largely separated worlds. So Microsoft introduced IIS. We started providing the ability to do dynamic pages and start hooking these things together. So now let me fast forward to where we are today. We've got the second generation. And what we've done is we've kind of glued these two things next to each other. We stuck the internet onto that application architecture. And we started doing some things to the application architecture. We factored it away from being client server now to an interior architecture. We pulled out the UI logic, but you'll notice that the rich UI logic and the browser are still kind of separate things. We made a ton of improvements to the component model. Complus services gives us the ability to do robust transacted operations across a low balance set of clusters and make those components operate in a reliable manner. We made major improvements into our, our data connectivity and host integration strategy. And that's where we were when we took Visual Studio 6. That was the N-tier Windows DNA architecture. Now, at the time, we were at the PDC, about the time of Visual Studio Beta 1, and we were getting feedback from you folks and from all kinds of customers about the need to do more. So I was the architect on VI6. We had a great story building rich, web-based UI. Meanwhile, the VB team had been doing really interesting work on adding internet connectivity to individual basic. And these were two, again, kind of separate worlds. And there was some tension between the teams. And so one day, Brad Lovering, who was the architect on Visual Basic, and I said, you know what? We're thinking about what we need to do with our V next. Why don't we go to lunch and see what we got? 
So Brad and I sat down in Building 4, and we both sketched out architectures for where we the next versions should go. And the amazing thing is they looked the same. That we knew that we needed to take our kind of leading client server, Windy A tool that was focused on this part of the architecture, and we knew we need to merge it together. And there are a couple of reasons for this. When we looked at the internet model, we saw some really interesting innovations going on. There were some powerful ways that people were using the web infrastructure to achieve tremendous scalability. So let me just talk about two kinds of interaction that were occurring between the browser and the middle tier. So when you type in www.mycompany.com, the first thing that happens is it goes up to that DNS server and it looks up the IP address. And what people are doing today is sometimes when you look up that IP address, for example, if you log in on the West Coast, they might send you to a data center in San Jose. Folks on the East Coast might get a data center in New Jersey. So they're kind of getting a geo-scalability. We can have data centers around the world. And then we use techniques like Windows Load Balancing Server, Cisco Local Director, to route that thing to not just one machine, but a whole collection of machines inside that data center. So the browser doesn't connect necessarily to a single device through a single connection that's always maintained. It has a routed connection. And that routed connection is, in a sense, stateless in that we don't know what machine we're going to go to, and because we include enough information in that connection to get the job done, we can start replicating this thing and get that huge amount of scalability. So we said, hey, that seems pretty great. Why don't we use that as a core part of our infrastructure? So that's the first major change that we saw coming in this next generation. So we talked about moving the internet, not just to be something that was on the side and exclusively used projecting UI, but to be a core part of the architecture and used between all of the tiers. So we started talking to the various groups around the company, to the other architects, we talked to the folks doing XML, and they said, XML is going to be big. You got to think about XML as the way to connect together data and so on. And so we thought, hey, we could use that loosely coupled, stateless communication model that the internet scribes to talk to the servers and to get the data going. We also were talking to the folks in MSN who were running things like Hotmail. They said, well, the other great thing about the internet is that somebody else can run your servers for you. Instead of you having to go set up and configure and get all the parameters right on that server, suppose somebody else just ran it for you. So we saw, hey, we could take some of those servers and we could have a set of building block services. Things were that were out on the web, things like Passport, Exchange, and, and Hotmail, things like calendaring services. People could run those things and we could talk to them using those same open internet protocols and XML. And that, that would really change the application model. So think about this. Back when people first started building Windows, what they would do is they would they would program that Windows message loop, and it was pretty complicated. And then people said, hey, we have components. And so with products like VB, you could take a bunch of these components, drop them on a form, wire them together, and suddenly you had a pretty cool app. Well, we could do the same thing now with service. And instead of just getting code reuse, what we could have is a lot more reuse. We could have somebody else do the setups and the configuration. We could have somebody else actually the operations. So we would get all, all that leverage, not only the code, but of the operations for those web services. So that was one of the key architectural changes that we knew we wanted to enable. First, base it on all open internet protocols, get that loosely coupled model, and then start allowing people to aggregate applications by, by putting together these services. Like any good architects, we said, hey, that better be recursive, right? So your application probably wants to be a service in and of itself because people want to reuse those programmable application components to be able to do other things. And if we enable that, if we let our application almost trivially become a web service in and of itself, then we could enable much richer operations on that thing, ad hoc aggregation of the capabilities, and do even richer UIs. So let's take a look at the UI. So of course we wanted to take kinds of things that we were doing in Visual Interdev, which made it much easier to project that UI out from the data. And we're going to continue to support, in fact, 
We've done some major things that you've probably seen in web forms that are going to make that pretty cool. But we're going to, we're going to push that to the next level. We're going to keep enhancing the browser and the offline capabilities and so on to be able to enable smarter clients. And they're going to use that same web service architecture. So we'll be able to use XML and web services, take that app offline, or to do more high-performance interactive UI, to do things like uh, displays that take the data and cache it locally, all again using those open internet protocols. So that's where we arrived. We saw richer, more productive user interfaces. We saw the open internet protocol bringing this all together. We saw the servers being growing up into services and having the ability for companies both to run the server as well as just pick up the service, things like a SQL server in the sky if they didn't want to go set it up, and then the applications themselves becoming web services. So that's what we knew we wanted to go build. So I want to take a second now and kind of go through some of these pieces and talk about how those things are constructed. So probably all of you have seen this slide, Paul Moritz talked about that this morning, hopefully you were all awake for that part, where we said we're taking the second generation Wins DNA architecture and we're going to build the third generation on top of it by leveraging the internet inside. Then we're going to take all of our core products and we're going to move them to that new platform. So we're taking Windows, Internet Explorer, and enhancing it to support these new protocols and this new way of doing business. We talked to Anders Heilsberg, and he came to Microsoft to work with us on creating a comprehensive, integrated program environment, where he was a real leader in doing that. And we said, Anders, can you do that with the web world? And he worked with us and created the, the .NET framework, which encapsulates what we were doing in Com, but kind of brings to the next level. We talked to all the folks working on enterprise servers, and distinguished engineers like Peter Spiro and others worked with us to augment SQL Server and Exchange and other things to make those things .NET Enterprise servers. We have folks out there building the building block services, Amit's team building BizTalk to glue all this together, and finally we've got Visual Studio make a comprehensive whole. So that's where we wanted to go. We wanted to take our, our WinDNA assets, leverage them so that what you know today is going to be the basis for what we're building in the future. Okay. Now let's kind of go down one level and talk about what exactly is a web service. So sitting on everyone's desk is a blue book. I hope you all have that this morning. And that describes very precisely what a web service is. A web service is actually a pretty simple thing. Essentially, when we have a web service, it becomes this programmable application component. And we're just going to get, we're going to send HTTP requests to it, and we're going to get back XML. Now you've probably heard of SOAP. SOAP is a way to describe those XML formats so that you can do this. So we're going to send an HTTP request with some XML in the packet. The server will process that and send us back some more XML. SOAP gives us a way to, to make sure that it interrupts, and we've been working on that with guys like um, the Userland software guys, Elementor, IBM, and many others. And there's pretty broad industry commitment to move to the SOAP protocol. Now, SOAP is a couple of extra little things in order to make all this stuff work. The first thing we need to be able to do is we need to be able to go up to the website and say, hey, do you have any web services? And it'll respond using SOAP discovery protocol. Say, yep, I have some web services. Here's a link to those things. That's a pretty, pretty simple protocol that we have, a place to do that, that's described in this document. Um, but really, all it's going to do is going to send us back a link. Then once we have that link, we're going to go get that XML document. That XML document is going to describe the set of messages that you need to send to the server and the order in which you need to send them in order for things to work. And all that works on top of SOAP, which is just plain old XML and HTTP. And all of that is based on standard internet protocols, XML, the W3C schema standard, which is XSD, HTTP, and SMTD. So in practice, how does this work? And the reason I say in practice is that these things are open. We can, as things like the binary XML formats occur, or there become more advanced internet protocols with higher performance, all of this will automatically take advantage of those capabilities. But today, in simplest case, here's what you do. 
at design time or if you're doing this dynamically, you do a URL request to the root of that website and you're going to get back an XML or an HTML document which has a link in it to the service contract like the SOAP contract language in there. You follow the link. You do an HTTP request up there. You're going to get back an XML file that describes the messages and their order. So now you know enough to program against the web service. You send an HTTP request with a SOAP XML body. The server processes it. And if necessary, it sends back the response with the XML SOAP body describing the result. That's a web service. Make sense? Pretty straightforward stuff. And again, that's all documented here. So then the question becomes, how do you go build with those things? So it's pretty interesting. You can build those things a lot of different ways. For example, we're going to show you a web service that's built on top of Solaris in just a minute. Web services can be built on any platform using, for example, Solaris as an operating system, running the Apache server, written in Perl. And this is going to give us incredible interop. So applications written with .NET framework will be able to use web services written on these other platforms, and vice versa. So if I use the .NET framework and I produce a web service, if you know how to use those web service protocols, you'll be able to consume it. And this means that all of our tools and all of the things that Microsoft has been building to make it easy will be able to automatically interrogate these web services and put it together. So think about it. Suppose somebody like Yahoo, who uses BSD, exposes their mail service as a programmable service. Bring up Visual Studio, type in www.yahoo.com, and all of a sudden, up comes the set of methods that you can make calls to to the Yahoo service, and you'd be able to use Visual Studio to program against that. Now, Microsoft is going to build a bunch of platforms to make this easy. You can use our existing WinDNA platform to do that, and we offer a great platform for doing that. We've got the best XML support, parsers. We've got very sophisticated HTTP processing systems in IIS, very high performance. We have full extensibility through the protocols, which enabled us to support this thing. We've got the tools to target it. And we've provided things like the SOAP SK, the SOAP toolkit, which makes that even easier. But where the .NET framework really excels is it makes all this stuff automatic. So as you saw when Dave Menlin came up earlier and he created a web service, he just created a function. He said that that function is a web service and our execution environment took care of creating the discovery protocol, the SCL documents, hooking up all the business logic, taking care of doing this in the most high performance way. So we've gotten rid of all the Beaster copies, script engine invocations to make this thing just a beeline from the invocation directly to the code and out. So that's what the .NET framework was, is all about. And we're going to be going through that in detail. Mark Andrews is about to come onto stage, and we're going to walk through that. So I just want to take one more second and describe some web services and then sketch out the overall blueprint. So in terms of the web services, so if we were to look up here, what we've got are a whole bunch of different kinds of services that people are likely to go build. My expectation is that many of the people in the audience, particularly people that used to be ISVs, are likely to go build many of the initial web services that people use. You're going to build, we know companies out there, for example, that are building things like geographic map services, people that are making credit card statements available as a web service. You can imagine the National Bureau of Standards, for example, hooking up an atomic clock so that there'd be a time service available. The you could do easy synchronization inside your application. I don't know what all the web services are. That's for you folks to figure out and go build. Inside the company, there's going to be many of these web services. For example, maybe your sales data is something that you want to expose as a web service so that any time anyone wants to put that into an application, it's as easy as pointing to the sales website. Internal billing and fulfillment services, corporate directories, all of those things can become web services and then easily aggregated and integrated to your application. And so just like all of you are going to be building web services, Microsoft is going to go build some. We're building Passport, which gives a single sign-on capability. We're going to be providing directory and search services, personalization services, services to help deliver software, calendaring 
service so that people can run their schedules and get those things to integration. Notification services and SQL storage in the sky that supports XML. All of those services are things that we plan to build and to provide to you developers to hook into your applications over the course of the next few years. Now, if you're wondering about how you get to those things, again, from inside your company, you're going to use standard HTTP. And one of the worries people have about these things is security and so on. So let me just start by saying that firewalls can handle these things. Firewalls can be configured to detect the appropriate protocols and to either allow or disallow ac action on these services. So as the administrators, you're going to be able to manage and control these things. So that kind of gives you the big picture. We have web services. We have all these things hooking together. So here's a quick blueprint. You want to build your application or web service. Well, we know that you're probably going to want to use a set of a standard internet, universal kind of connectivity mechanisms to get there. That's what the SOAP Blue Book is all about. Using those connectivity protocols, you're going to talk to the internal services that you build. You're also going to want to probably talk to a set of servers, things like SQL, Exchange, and BizTalk to make those things happen. You're going to want to talk to the building block services that Microsoft is going to be producing and all the third-party services that are likely to be built by folks here. You're going to target clients using the same application model. And there's going to be a variety of clients. I'm going to expand this out in just a second. And there's going to be other applications using your service. And so as a platform, Microsoft has put together the .NET application services, all the things inside to make it easy. We're going to be enhancing all our versions of Windows to support this. We've provided the integrated .NET framework to put it together. We have a comprehensive operations platform and the orchestration piece to help pull it all together. And finally, Visual Studio .NET has been, Visual Studio has been enhanced via a .NET version that intrinsically supports all of this. Now, if I were to go down kind of one more level on this blueprint, we're going to use blueprint throughout the rest of the conference so that you can see where all the pieces are. What we've done is we've filled in all different kinds of servers that we're providing. So you can imagine up in your internal services, the things that you build. Here's a list of the different servers that we're providing. Everything from SQL to BizTalk to Application Center to manage things, comm server, host integration server to get data, internet security and acceleration server to provide proxy and firewall characteristics, as well as for caching, and exchange server to provide the email and the message connectivity. All of those things are going to support the .NET framework. All of those things are going to be built on top of Windows. In the device space, we're certainly supporting standard browsers, and we're going to make that great. We have the ability to automatically level and to take advantage of the new capabilities of the latest browsers. We're going to have a light version of the .NET framework that's going to be available for devices. We're going to have a set of enhancements to the browser, to IE to directly support the .NET framework so that you have a single system programming model. We're going to merge that rich client model and that browser model in that second generation into one. And that's going to support the .NET framework, support advanced versions of Windows. So there you have it. Those are all the things we're going to be talking to you about in this conference. And we're going to go through them one by one and, and kind of go through in detail how all that stuff works. Okay, so let's move on to Mark. I want to talk for a second about the .NET framework. We're going to zoom in now on the .NET framework, and we're going to talk about how that was constructed. So at the very bottom of the .NET framework is a new common language runtime. The common language runtime is something that we constructed because we knew we wanted to be able to provide rich security, operational characteristics to be able to support new kinds of processors and so on. All, and have all those languages interop in a seamless way. So for example, we want to be able to have a C++ class inherit from a VB class and vice versa. So we constructed that thing and we made it so that third parties could build all kinds of different languages on top of that thing. We're announcing 17 languages here at the conference that people are going to support everything from APL to COBOL to LISP, Perl to Python and anything. Anybody can build on top of this thing that wants to. And there's, there's been all kinds of requests for languages on this. For example, you wouldn't believe it, but Fortran's a big request. There's a version of COBOL that runs on, on this thing. Um, and of course, people have asked about Java. Anybody can build on this thing. We provide the infrastructure to do that. Once you build on this thing, 
you get all kinds of interesting capabilities. We're providing a rich set of base classes that include things like collections, um, security, flexion, and they work with all the languages. So if you write a component in one language, whether it be COBOL or Script or Perl or Python, all the other languages can use that. We have a rich set of data classes. Mark Anders will be talking about how we take our data and we fully support XML as well as relational data. And then we can take that data and we project the UIs out as standard HTML UIs or potentially richer, as well as web services. And that's the thing that's going to let us get to the next level in terms of connectivity. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mark Anders. And Mark Anders is going to take us through the top level of this framework. And he's going to show us how the typical developer to take these things, stitch them together, produce applications. Mark. Thank you, John. Thanks. Next slide, please. So my name is Mark Anders, and what I'm going to be doing today is walking you through the .NET frameworks, which can be used to build applications of any type and run with any language. Now, in the next presentation, Anders Hausberg, uh, next slide, I, thank you. In the next general session, Anders Hausberg is going to be giving you a walkthrough of all of the different frameworks and uh, drilling down deeply into their architecture. In this session, what I'm going to be doing is, is taking you through the frameworks and showing you what it's like to build applications using the frameworks. And I'm going to show you four things. Number one, I'm going to show you how to build rich UI with the .NET frameworks, how to access our integrated XML uh, system to project data from databases uh, using HTML UI. I'm then going to take you through and show you how you can build those same business objects that you used in your UI application and expose them as XML web services. Next, I'm going to show how you can take rich web applications and access them either online or bring them offline for disconnected use. And finally, I'm going to show you how we can make applications available on any device. Now, what I'm going to use to do that is a new technology, a new part of the uh, .NET framework called Axe Server Pages. Plus. And Active Server Pages Plus takes that, a, that core AI programming model of you write code and everything's very, very dynamic, very fast development environment, and it takes it really to the next level. So it's truly a component based system. It's very factored, so you can plug in at multiple levels. It allows you to separate the code from the content so that uh, designers and developers can work together. And as you've seen, it was designed from the ground up to enable Visual Studio to give you a great WYSIWYG experience. Now, the application I'm going to be building is actually, interestingly enough, a site that sells espionage equipment, which is sort of timely. And Dave Mendlin uh, showed you in sort of the WYSIWYG drag drop mode. I'm also going to be doing quite a bit of dragging and dropping, but I'm actually going to be showing it to you in source code mode so that you can see that the underlying system is very clean. The code is very understandable. If you had to get in there with Notepad to write it yourself, you could easily do that. So with that, let's start building some applications. So what I have here is a very, very simple HTML page. It has a little form, and it uh, has an input, and a select, and a button. And if I go and run this, this is it running right here. You'll notice that if I type in my name, for example, say Mark, and say that I'm interested in deception, and click lookup, what I get back is the same thing. And the reason is because this is just HTML. There's no code on that back end. And with server-side uh, development, you actually have to write code to make everything happen, typically. So for example, if I wanted to, to take that page and print out a message that said, you know, hi, Mark, 
you're interested, you selected exception. I would need to write, write some server-side logic to t take the values that were posted back, format a string, and display it. Now, I'd also want to write the logic to take the, put the values back in the controls that, so when that new page came up, I didn't lose all of the values. And I'm sure all of you have used websites where you lose values on forms, and it's very, very frustrating. So first, before I show you how to do this in ASP+, Plus, let's review how we do that today using ASP. Well, here's the same page written using an ASP style of coding. And so you can see the first thing you'll notice is that it's, it's simple, right? ASP has made web development very, very simple. The code is pretty easy to write. But you'll notice also that there's quite a bit of it, right? So that when I spit out that input, I have to know that I have this name that was coming in, and I have to know that I've got to add that as an attribute so that when the page gets refreshed in the browser, that it has the name. Doing the select is a bit more complicated. You can see that uh, I've got to actually check the selected item, and as I'm spitting out each option tag, I have to say, is it, you know, deception? If so, then select that one. So that when the page comes back, that's what's selected. And finally, in order to actually print out my message, I have to know about, again, the data that came back. I have to know that there's the name and know how the category comes back in the HTTP request. And I have to generate a message. And the code is very intermixed here, so um, it's, it's difficult to have multiple people working on it at the same time. So if I request this page now, And I say, my name is Mark, and I like deception. It says, hello, Mark, you selected deception. Now, one thing I'd like to actually point out is that that page was actually written using ASP+. So ASP+, still has that, the capability of uh, uh, doing that ASP style programming. It's, it's compatible with the ASP uh, program model. But we have much, much easier, more powerful way to do these types of things now. So let me take you through. Let's go back to that original HTML page. The fundamental concept that ASP Plus introduces to make developing web pages easier is called the server control. And the server control is denoted by a tag with an attribute that says run at equal server. So I can add that to the input tag, for example. What happens is that when the ASP a compiler loads that page and compiles it into the code that will execute, it notices that there's this server-side control. It instantiates a control that will run on the server. It's server-based code. There's nothing running on the client. And that control is going to be responsible for generating the proper uh, UI description that goes down, whatever that might be. It might be HTML, DHTML, references to other types of code to pull in. And it's also going to interact with the HTTP events that come back to, to deal with its state and fire events. So the entire programming model becomes very much like what you're, you do on the line today, where you have components, you've got events, you've got properties and methods, and you can interact with them. So let me switch to a page that has all of the run at equal server attribute added, and I'll just save that and come back and let's request that page. Now, I haven't actually added any code. I haven't written any code. All I've done is put these little attributes. And you'll notice now, if I say, hi, Mark, and you're interested in travel, that the values are automatically maintained. That's because the controls are complete encapsulations. They do the same thing functionally that a troll does on the client. They take care of interacting with the user and displaying the UI except these ones are just running on the server. So let's see how we would write some code to add message that we printed out in the other application. So the first thing I'm going to do is drag a little label control, which is just, in this case, an HTML span. And you'll notice that it has an ID of message. The IDs that we assign to these server controls become their programmatic identifiers so that we can write code that goes against these. So next, I'm going to drag some event handler code here. And this is a little click handler. It's written in Visual Basic, so you might notice that we have strong typing. 
Again, we can use any language. And the system is actually compiled now. We're past ASP, ASP was interpreted. It, uses, it used script languages only. We can now use C++. We can use C Sharp. We can even use COBOL to create active server pa uh, plus pages. Active server pages plus pages. It's a, a little bit tongue twister. Now, you saw Dave Mendelin add similar code. And what he did in the tool, he double clicked on the button and it brought him to the method. What's actually happening under the covers is there's a binding create between the button, which is going to actually fire the click event, and this code. And so let me show you how it actually gets wired up. It's very, very simple. What I do is I add an attribute to the button that says the name of the event equals the name of the function. So in this case, it's the on server click because it's the click that's generated on the server. And it's going to cause the submit button click function to be called. So that's it. So if I go back and um, refresh the page, and now say, you know, hi, Mark, you like communications. Say, hi, Mark, you selected communications. So you'll notice a couple of things. Um, Number one, the code that I've written is much, much cleaner. It's not intermixed. Now, I'm writing it all in the same file. ASP Plus actually supports a number of different modes. For the ASP developer, the person who's used to having a single file, you can put all of the code in that file. If you'd like to separate it out, you can do that too. And if you'd like to separate it out and compile it ahead of time and not deploy the code, but only deploy the compiled version of the code, you can do that as well. So it supports a number of different development methodologies that you can use depending on your requirements. So, as I mentioned earlier, data and XML is deeply integrated into the platform. The .NET frameworks are really centered at having great uh, interoperability with XML to, to make object and XML seem seamless, to make data that comes from relational databases and XML seem, uh, appear as one so that you have a consistent way of dealing with all different types of data. And one of the chief things that you do in HTML objection applications is you write business components that go against databases and you project that out as UI. Now, a lot of you who might have developed in Active Server Pages know that you use ADO and you have these loops that go out and spit out HTML tables. We have a much, much simpler model for working with data. So the first thing that you would do um, is add a control that's going to generate the view of the data. Now, all of the controls that I've shown you so far are low-level HTML controls. They map one-to-one -one with HTML elements. But what you really like is far richer controls, and we have that. So what I'm going to do is replace the span with a data grid. And I've said properties. The property, the attributes of the tag allow you to configure the properties of the component. So I've added in this data grid. And now let me replace the code that uh, I have at the top here, which is currently displaying the message, with some code to instantiate a business object, invoke it, and uh, have the data uh, produced. So you'll notice that this is using C Sharp. As I mentioned a couple of times, you can use any language inside of ASP+, and again, they're all compiled. Now what we're doing is we're instantiating this I buy spy products category business object, the products database. We're calling the get category method, passing in the currently selected item from the list. So now, when I click on lookup and say I like deception, what I get back is a view of the data. And this looks similar to some other views you've seen. And it also illustrates one of the the challenges that we had in taking a control-based model and using it for web development. Today, when you develop in VB, you use a bunch of controls and you actually get to know their look and feel. 
right? So you might look at an application and say, oh, I recognize that. That's the Microsoft tab dialog control. Or that's the Microsoft table. Or this is a better look table, so this, this is obviously the Sheridan or Farpoint table, because it looks a lot cooler. And typically with these controls, you can configure their property, right? So you can set font, you can set the background color, you turn grid lines on and off, but you can't typically radically alter their look and feel. And the web is all about rich presentation of data. And so what we've come up with to address that, to allow you to, to build the rich experience that you want to build for the web, while still having a rich control model, is the idea of templatized controls. And what a template is, is that a control can expose a number of properties, which are templates, that a user can provide some blocks of code that are used to provide various looks and feel. So, for example, you can imagine a list control might say something like, I have a, a template that I support for how to draw and how to create an item. I have another one for the header, the footer, for the separate. And the user can use those to completely customize the look and feel. So let me re just replace the, the data grid I have here with a rich data list where I'm providing it a template. And you'll notice that the template has data binding expressions inside of it. You can also pass in other server controls. You can pass in code. It's fully hierarchical, so you can actually create any type of look and feel that you want. And so now, when I uh, click on the lookup, and what's happening when that, there's that pause is it's actually recompiling everything and uh, then uh, generating the HTML. So now when I click lookup, I get something that is much richer and more like what you expect to see in a web application. So you can use controls and completely customize uh, the look and feel. Now controls aren't only about uh, pure presentation. You can also use them to encapsulate complex tasks that you might do in an application. And controls also provide a very nice abstraction level for supporting multiple types of devices. So you can support multiple browser types. You can take advantage of more client resources, for example. So one of the chief things that is very time consuming to do in a web application is validation of user input. It's very complicated code to write typically because you'd like to take as much advantage of the client as possible and writing all the logic so that the validation can happen on the client or the server can be very, very complicated. So we've created a set of controls that completely encapsulate that. So let me add validation to this page. So the first thing I'm going to do is because I've got this select that has communications, deception, and travel, I'm going to add another item that is sort of the invalid selection, so that if, if this one is chosen, I report that to the user and say, you know, you actually need to select a category. So I'm just going to add that little select category um, item to the, uh, to the select. The next thing I'm going to do is drop in two validator controls. And AS Plus actually comes with a whole suite of validation controls to do different types of validation. You can match against regular expressions, numeric values, things like that. These are simply required field validators. And what I provide to them is the name of the control to validate, the error message, and some attributes about how that gets displayed to the user. And so now, if I go and refetch the page, let me get rid of my name, tab out, you'll notice that just tabbing out causes a message to be generated said, you must enter your name. So the validation controls completely encapsulated uh, sending down the, the logic of the client that would execute to do that check with the error message and everything. If I go here and say select category, it gives me those, uh, those uh, error messages. So now if I actually fill it in and select uh, deception again, I guess I like that one. I get my data. Now the last thing I have to do is because we support client's uh, server-side validation is I actually need to protect my code so that if form is submitted, if button click happens when the data is not filled up correctly, that I can actually take an action and protect myself. 
So what I'm going to do is just replace this code with code that checks a variable that's on the page called is valid. And all of the validators work together to see if all of them are valid, if all of the conditions met, that will be valid. Otherwise, it won't. And so the result will be that I won't query the database if submitted invalid data. And let me go to an old version of Netscape for, to sh illustrate how we handle uh, more down-level browsers. And again, this is sort of an older version of Netscape. And so now if I, uh, you know, select these two things, uh, let me, oh, I'm on a different page. If I say look up, then I do a round trip to the server, it does the validation, it returns the page, I run my data logic. If I type in my name is Mark, and finally if I select a, uh, communications, only then do I get it. So, so really without writing any code differently for the two browsers, I was able to get, take advantage of rich client functionality, or do the processing on the server, all without rewriting my code. And we have a, a, a suite of controls that make it easy to support these multiple devices. So with that, let me go and show you the completed application. This is iBuySpy. And we actually last night launched uh, www.iBuySpy.com on the internet so that you can actually visit that. You can uh, browse for some cool spy gear. And you can also download the code, maybe more importantly, in either VB or C Sharp and check it out. It's really a very well written app. There's extensive documentation, and they have some really cool, uh, cool stuff. Um, so I can look at uh, at various tools. I can look at um, travel uh, categories, and it brings up really great views of the uh, of the of the uh, the things. This is a uh, high tech miniaturized extracting tool. It's excellent for extracting foreign objects from your person. Now you probably can't read that because it's pretty small. It also has advanced capabilities such as you can submit product reviews. And oh, we actually have one here. It's from somebody named Larry. And it says, make them bigger. I try to use these to pick things out of trash, but they're too small. And he only gives it one little uh, bullseye. So I guess he didn't like that one. So we can take that feedback and improve our product line. So they've got some really cool stuff. I actually like this face, fake mustache translator. And this is a, it's a disguise device. You know, conceals your identity. And also, when you wiggle your nose, it will turn your voice, in, it will toggle between a set of languages. It says here, English, French, and Arabic, and Spanish. So it's pretty high-tech. It's $5.99. It's excellent on diplomatic missions. I think I'll buy this one. And uh, that looks good, so I will say final checkout. When we get to this page, so far we've really talked just about building your interface. But a key part of the platform is really building and consuming these XML-based web services. And on this page, we're actually running two prototype services. One from American Express that provides credit card authorization. So we can authorize the credit card, and it has my profile data filled in because because I've uh, filled it in previously. And the second is, when I enter the ship to address, we might need to verify that. Um, I actually filled in where I am now, you know, the Orange County Convention Center main stage uh, in Orlando, Florida. And Inverge has created uh, also a prototype of their address verification service. So when I go and submit this, you'll notice it said uh, credit card is approved, but it had to make actually some corrections to my address. And so it shows it now as the Orange County Convention Center. I actually, a very poor speller, so I had wrote uh, C-O-N-V. And it filled in the actual correct address so that, uh, you know, uh, whoever is shipping with can find me. And it filled in the zip code that I didn't know. So this is an example of using web services to add really powerful services to your app and give the users a much better experience when they uh, visit your site. So with that, you know, I'm going to do the final checkout and uh, I'll submit order here. And so I just bought myself a $600 high-tech mustache, which is pretty cool. So we talked now a little bit about web services and building uh, 
web services to uh, aggregate services. You can imagine that somebody like a bookseller might want to expand its business opportunities by adding web services. So let's take a look at how to do this. This is Duwamish Online, and maybe some of you have this application. This is version 7, which has been written on top of the .NET framework. And it's a rich app. You can go and you browse for books and stuff. Um, it's you know, very well written. And uh, select books, buy them. And what they'd really like to do, though, is open their store to partners, right? So you might, you could imagine that they'd want to have a web service that uh, allows you to query for books, uh, the images and everything, and the pricing, and then order them so that partners could integrate that service into their site. Somebody like, like I Buy Spy, for example. So let's see how we, we would write that. ASP Plus has an, a new type of page, which is called an .asmx page that stands for um, Active Server Pages Plus Method Pages. And this allows you to have the same programming model as ASP, meaning you write code, you save it on the, in the file system, and it's automatically compiled and exposed, in this case, as a web service. So on these pages, you don't actually write any HTML because it doesn't have to do with HTML. You actually don't write XML either. You simply think of the business logic that you want to write, and you tell it what methods that you want to expose as a web service, and it does the rest for you. Now, again, there are a variety of different uh, development paradigms. I can put the code in the ASMX file, I put it in a separate file, or, and what I'm doing here in VB, is I've actually written a VB file that links to the .ASMX, and I'm actually going to be compiling it. Now, we have actually added the method here, so it's just the, the class description. And I previously compiled this. So you'll notice if I request it, I get an HTML page that describes the web service. And I think you've seen this uh, type of page before. What we do is we automatically generate a help page so that if you hit it with a browser that's not expecting XML, that a user can come and find out about your service. Now, of course, you can completely customize page or you can conceal it all together if you don't want users to be able to just browse your web services. We also dynamically generate the, the contract, and we can take a look at that by clicking on the contract link. And this is automatically generated for you. And it gives us information about the web service and how, how to interact with it. So let me go back to Visual Studio, and let me add a method. Now, what this method does is it uses the same business object that Duwam uses for their HTML site uh, side of their application. And let me just scroll. It's a little malformatted here. But it instates the business object, um, takes the product category. You, we, we're simply passing in the, the topic name and the quantity of, uh, of objects that we want returned as a string and as an integer. And it's then returning a record set. So from the program standpoint, you're not thinking about, a, uh, about XML at all. You, you don't have to think about HTTP and how values arrive. You just think about the business logic that you have and, how, and that you want to put on the web. And you'll notice that this is tagged as a web method so that the various methods in the class are not automatically exposed because you might have, for example, helper methods that are public that you don't want to expose on the web. So you explicitly tag the, the methods that you want to expose maximum security. So I've uh, compiled that. And if I go back and uh, hit F5, you'll now notice that it's dynamically generated a new help page that has that method. If I go and check out the contract, you'll notice that it now has actually how to interact with that method the references to all the schemas so that you can uh, understand it. And, uh, and uh, tools will use this to automatically build things like proxies for you. Or you can use it yourself. Now, the help page also gives me a way that I can invoke the service directly to try it out. So I might be interested in something like espionage. I guess I've done this before. And I'd like maybe 20. And doing that, that web service request brings back 
XML that represents all the different books that Duwamish has about um, espionage. And there's some very interesting ones here for those who can read the XML. Now let's switch back to, uh, to Abai Spy here and see how they would integrate that web service into their application. So let me go. This is actually a page uh, from the iBuySpy site. And it, at this point, doesn't have logic in it. It's just the HTML uh, APX template that will display uh, some data. So if I go and I uh, request this, what I get is, I think that's being recompiled. What I get is just the page with the categories and all that stuff, but without any data. So if I now go back to Visual Studio and uh, you know drag and drop this VB code in there, what it's going to do is it's going to instantiate the catalog service, which was the proxy that Visual Studio automatically generated that gives it uh, the programmatic interface. And it calls the get books by topic name was exposed uh, in the other um, window on the other machine gets the data set. So again, from a consumer of a web service, you're not thinking about XML either. Right? The data is coming in XML, but it could be coming in as any XML format, for example. It could be coming in as SOAP. You can uh, add support for different schemas. It's a very flexible system. It comes in simply as a record set. Then we can set the data binding property of the list, as we did in the other one, and call the data bind method. So if I save that, and now request the page, we can see some books. Now, I've already embarrassed myself by buying a stupid mustache, uh, so I'm not going to buy the spy who shagged me, um, or any of the other ones, or Harriet the spy, uh, which is maybe if you had kids, that would be great. Yeah? What's that? They said it was urgent. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, I'm, I'm, I really apologize. Let's see what's in here. Oh my, it's the mustache that I ordered. So uh, let me just put this on. Do you recognize me? Oh. And I, I have to be very careful when I have that. Actually, let me just leave it off. It's a, it's a high-tech device. And if I wiggled my nose the, the wrong way, I could slip into Arabic and have to deliver the, the rest of the talk in Arabic. And uh, I might not know how to get out of it, out of that mode. So let's take a look. Now that you know, I've uh, just spent $599 on uh, this mustache, this high-tech mustache, I'm going to have to figure out how to pay for it. And luckily, um, you know, since I'm here on business, I think I'll just expand it to Microsoft. So let's take a look at another application that we've developed, uh, which is F FM Expense, which is a rich web application built using ASP Plus that's an expense reporting app. So let me log on. Uh, I, I'm now going by the name of M, which for any of you who have seen James Bond as one of James's uh, cohorts, since I'm in, so into this espionage stuff. And uh, I don't have any reports uh, that I've uh, currently done, but let me go and import my credit card details. Now, now M Expense has also been written to consume web services. So it can go out to a prototype service that we wrote to provide credit card details and automatically import those. So if I uh, click on that, we can see that I obviously bought a mustache and I have a, a hotel bill. It's interesting. It's going to be hard to explain why you know, my mustache was 600 and my hotel for, you know, for a whole week was only uh, 800 something dollars. So let me just um, import these. So I, I guess the mustache is conference and seminar. Um, and uh, the hotel, obviously, is uh, other travel and lodging. And I'll import those. That invokes the web service, you know, pulls those records down, uh, the actual data, and, uh, and puts them into my expense report. First, I'll give it a title. These are my PDC expenses. And uh, I actually bought a cup of coffee, and I want to, you know, make sure that Microsoft pays for everything that they're supposed to pay for. So let me just add that. And you'll notice this is written using DHTML. So 
uh, these controls that are, that uh, make up this application can actually project for uh, multiple different browser types. This is uh, taking full support of DHTML, so I can insert a row, and I can say uh, coffee and uh, um, that's actually a meal, and it's uh, three bucks. And I think that's it. I think that's good for my expenses. So uh, I'm going to just submit that. And you can see some previous expense reports that I had uh, uh, done. And now I'm going to just log out. Now, the way expense reporting works at Microsoft is that you know, it, I don't get to just get the money directly out of the bank account. It actually has to go to my manager, and he has to approve it. And he's actually a pretty busy guy, David Treadwell. And so he might log into FM expense and look for pending approvals. And this shows him that M uh, submitted a, uh, an approval. But uh, I know that uh, uh, David is about to go on vacation, and so he's probably not going to get to that. So what he's going to do is actually take this application offline. And so the first thing he's going to do is synchronize the data by pressing the synchronize button. That is going to pull down all of the data from the database, from the SQL Server database that, that houses it, install it locally, and then he can click the take offline button. ASP Plus has a new feature called the personal tier that allows you to actually run the same code within the browser. There's actually not a web server run at all. And you'll notice it, it's kind of hard to see, but the protocol has changed to a, a protocol called MyWeb. And what this does is it loads that same infrastructure, the same code that was running on the server, and now runs it offline in the browser. Uh, it's because it's actually a new instance of the application, David has to log in again. And I can do that. And he can go and check out the approvals again. And he can say, okay, um, luckily he's not going to look inside um, because he just trusts me for some strange reason. And he's going to just click approval. Now, he hasn't actually gone online yet. So you could imagine that, uh, let's say he shuts down the browser, he goes and you know, he rests on the island and he comes back all rushed and he says, what did I do? Poor Mark is out, you know, tons of money. And it automatically logs in because it has his identity. And he says, oh, what do I have um, pending? And oh boy, I have that, that pending approval from Mark. I think I did that offline. So what he's going to do is resynchronize. Just hit the, the uh, resynchronize button again, and it's going to pull the data back from the client uh, onto the server, and now he goes to pending approvals that have actually all been approved. So this shows how you can take that same application model, that same ASP Plus program application model, and build client applications that don't require a web server and pitch offline applications. And you'll be hearing, you can attend a, a talk on the personal tier and building these types of applications in some of the breakout sessions. Now, I just added a cup of coffee, and typically when I'm at a restaurant or, you know, running around uh, before a talk like this, I don't actually have my computer there, and I probably haven't brought it offline because I'm just trying to, you know, make that I give my talk, so I'm much more likely to use something like my cell phone. And in addition to iBuySpy, we also have uh, fmxsense.com uh, on the internet. And so I can use my uh, AT&T wireless phone to actually log in. And right now I'm at my favorites menu. So let me just connect. And I'm going to actually log in to FM Expense and submit uh, an expense. Now, one of the, the, uh, the that Dave Mendlin showed you earlier was the set of mobile controls. And what the mobile controls do is they, too, are adaptive. So they will detect whether you're coming in with a browser that understands WML or a small device that understands HTML. With the exact same code, they will render for those multiple uh, devices. Here I'm hitting it with a uh, cell phone that expects uh, WML. And this is actually a very cool phone. And so let me just log in. 
So let me just create a uh, new instance. And let's switch back to this machine for a second, because I want to show you this. I'm going to log into the same fmfence.com uh, machine. Log in as me. And so I have a currently outstanding report. It has a taxi expense. That's all it has. And so let me go over here and say new expense, back to the cell phone. And it was today, it was meals. I'm going to add it to the PDC report so it knows about the report that I've already opened. And the amount was $3. It's actually, uh, it was a pretty good cup of coffee, though. So I submit the amount, and then I put in the description. So it's um, coffee. Oh, excuse me. I'm in the wrong mode. Let me go to quick mode. And it magically understands that I want coffee. So I'll just submit that. And you can imagine that I would, and it says expense successfully added, I might come back to my hotel room and log in with my PC and say, let me add some other expenses that I have. I just hit refresh, and there it has coffee. And there's a little bug, so it also added a foo, which I uh, added earlier. Showing the, the truly dynamic nature of the web. And uh, maybe I'll have to uh, 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 talk to my uh, credit card company and make sure I don't buy a foo. So with that, I've added that. And so what I've shown you in summary is the .NET framework really makes building web applications far easier. The code is much cleaner. Uh, you can separate the code from the content. You can use any language, and I use two of them. And I think you'll be seeing some more languages uh, during talk. Web services and XML support are deeply built into the .NET framework. Some of the areas that XML is being used that I didn't talk about, which in uh, some of the breakout sessions they'll be talking about, are, for example, the configuration system is now XML-based, so you can understand it. You can take relational data and XML data and deal with it either relationally or XML, so it's completely unified. But building web services is deeply uh, built into the .NET framework. And the .NET framework support any device at any time. So I can take my PC and use it online or offline. I can use a, a little uh, pocket PC or a, a Palm device or a cell phone, whether it's wireless or, or wired, and access my applications at any time. So finally, I'd like to recommend uh, that you check out some of the session tracks. For the stuff that I showed, there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, in, the, in the service delivery and the client tracks for ASP+. And you should really check out the, the, the data track to learn more about uh, the XML support. You should, as Paul Moritz said, start thinking about how you can uh, both expose web services and consume them in your application. And tomorrow, when you get those disks that John showed you, uh, install the .NET framework, the, the .NET framework SDK and Visual Studio .NET and uh, technology previews of those and really start building some cool apps. Uh, thank you very much. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, lunch is being served in Hall B and we'll be starting promptly at 1.15. Thank you.